Welcome back to the Roll Up High Roller community. As always, nothing on the Roll Up is to be construed as financial advice. We are just some educators in the DeFi space. Toss us a quick like, give us a share, a repost, send it to a friend who may want to watch this. And finally, give us a sub or a follow. It means the world to help support credibly neutral educational content in DeFi. We're here to educate, empower, and enrich you. And let's jump in. Welcome to DeFi by Design, where we talk all things blockchain and cryptocurrency, while striving to educate, empower, and enrich. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the DeFi by Design podcast. Here today with Rob Course and a good friend, Jan, whom I introduced at Epic ETH Infra Day in Istanbul this past year, talking about Zerkit. It's a really interesting uh, roll-up design. So we're going to learn more about that today. We're going to talk about the roll-up space as a whole. Some interesting things um, happening there. Um, so yeah, why don't we just jump right into it? And Jen, GM, welcome, welcome. Would love to hear uh, a bit about your, yourself for our lovely community um, and perhaps how you got here. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me back, actually, I should say. I've been on a um, roll of uh, podcast here before. And um, yeah, about me, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick intro. Uh, I was a former academic to some extent. Uh, I sort of did did some graduate degrees. I was finishing my PhD, and I saw that Web three was sort of an interesting space to work in. And so I, I was fortunate to to get a job in, in security in this space. And I've been you know doing stuff ever since. So for about five years, I've been uh, in the Web three ecosystem, um, largely as an auditor at at Quantstamp. But now uh, I am working on a project called Zirkit. Zirkit is uh, a new roll-up, which, you know, as you said, we'll talk about today. And, um, you know, I'm really excited to talk to you about that. And I can, you know, definitely tell you more about the experience and and what it takes to build one and, and what we've seen and just roll-ups in general, because I got in the space when, uh, when Plasma was hot. And I guess now Vitalik kind of wants to bring it back a little bit. He's, he had some talks on it recently, but, uh, you know, things have transitioned to roll up to mostly, and, and so that's what I'm focusing on these days. Very cool. Yeah, Andy and I both had the pleasure of meeting uh, meeting you in person. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy and uh, Epic Ethan for day. I met you at uh, Masari Mainnet in New York. Um, and at the time, I saw like this insight report that you had put together about like all of, like every roll up design you could think of, like ones that I had never even heard of. Um, so kind of like you mentioned, like you kind of got in, Plasma was hot, and now we're kind of like coming full circle. So like trace that circle for us a little bit as far as like the preliminary research that you've done and kind of your foundational knowledge. And then we'll we'll get to like the building blocks and, and why sure. and how you're building circuit on top of that. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think, you know, starting from the, the core principles, right, Plasma was sort of this nice idea that evolved alongside the Bitcoin Lightning Network and other early scaling solutions for, for blockchains. And the idea was, you know, let's let's somehow inherit some security from an underlying blockchain, but take some transactions off of the chain, and make sure that people don't have to sort of always look at every transaction. Uh, there was this sort of nice notion in, in Plasma, I think it was Plasma Cash, where you could sort of only watch your money, which is sort of more akin to like real world situations, right? You sort of, you're concerned what's going on in your bank account, but if someone else commits fraud, you're not really watching that. Uh, I mean, if you're the police, you are, if you're some really, some authority, or you have a really big stake in someone else's funds, you might be interested. But generally speaking, you know, if you trust that your money is, is um, operating in, in the correct way under the right assumptions, that's sort of good enough for you because then other people can trust you. And you can also watch the, the specific accounts you're going to interact with. And through this Plasma design, uh, which you know I, I haven't followed for, for quite some time now, but there were there were dozens of them. I remember there was this giant sheet of like 50 or 60 Plasmas, different variants. Everyone wanted to do their own little trick. It was, you know, watch your own money or watch only some of your money or, uh, you know, a different way to, to challenge if something went wrong or something that could, I don't know, change how the data is stored. There were tons of variations. But throughout all of that, and one of the big issues was sort of data availability, I think. And so people said, well, why don't we just 
require things to be published in. And that's basically how the design for a rollup came along. The gen general design, not any specific rollup, which is, you know, let's publish a bunch of data, do stuff off chain and put it on chain and then just check when it's on chain that some conditions are met to make it final, either a fraud proof or a zero knowledge proof. And that was really cool because as that was happening, you know, the cryptography was catching up as well. The, the strict uh, mathematical stuff that sort of needed to happen to remove the trust from all of those actors. So sort of rather than, you know, trusting people to, to watch their own money, we could just say, well, actually, they're going to do it right because of the math or, you know, some very incredibly small probability that it would go wrong. And um, that obviously allowed rollups to, you know, become really, really powerful. And I think now the idea is you could put that back into Plasma if you really cared about it to, to sort of get some, some different changes. But the design simplicity, I say simplicity, but it is quite complex still, uh, rollups is probably not going to go away in the, in the short term or long term, really, because um, some of these networks are already out there, right? There's a ton of rollups already developed with main nets, uh, with good test nets, with, with new ideas, uh, with a whole bunch of things. And um, they'll become entrenched, of course, and people will keep using them, regardless of if there's a slightly better solution. And when you're talking about like pennies for transaction fees, it, it's got to be really good for you to, to, to really care about the extra couple of cents. Uh, or you have to have a lot going on. And the average user probably, and maybe I'll, I'll get flack on this on Twitter or something. I, I, I don't imagine, you know, six cents versus seven cents in a transaction fee is really you know, going to be the game breaker going forward. Certainly going from whatever Ethereum is now to to those nickels or, and, and pennies, That's that will be huge. And so, of course, the roll-ups will win it. Um, yeah, so uh, that's basically yeah. you know, how sort of fundamentals happened. And then Personally, I was looking at all those things, right? Like I said, I was trying to figure out, you know, how are these plasmas working? How are these different rollups going to work? And at some point, um, sort of started getting my my hands dirty and started building parts of the system or looking at specific research questions, um, things like security, things like what data is actually you know being posted or or needs to be posted. Can we can we change that a bit because that could affect the cost? It could affect the trust assumption. Where do the data go, et cetera. Um, other things like bridges, uh, you know, big, big interest in, in bridges. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of money lost in, in bridges and, uh, you know, rollups, depending on who you ask again, uh, are just bridges plus another blockchain. Some people will, will argue that too, um, but certainly a bridge is involved. And so having these systems be secure is, um, is very important, especially because of the history that bridges have had, which is, which is not, Amazing. It, it's pretty good, but you know, last year it was like two billion dollars lost. I think I said this last time too. There's a lot of money lost in bridges, so I'm really worried about you know what rollups will will have happened to them. Hopefully nothing. I really hope nothing happens. But let's be realistic. You know, someone's probably going to screw up some. Yeah. So uh, this perspective comes from I guess years of being in the trenches with regards to being in, uh, in the development community as well as just in the broader crypto community. What what parts of this kind of and you know Vitalik put the uh, roll up centric roadmap out? I'm curious what parts of this of this current uh, existence that we are in for roll ups did you you know kind of predict or see coming, and what parts have kind of uh, surprised you? Um, or, you know, you thought maybe things would have been done a little bit differently. Yeah. Um... I don't know if I predicted much of it. Uh, I'll be honest, when I do in the space <laughs> with all the plasmas, I was playing catch up for a while. And I think when the shift happened, it was pretty clear that actually this is a simpler design. So I think the prediction that it would take off very quickly um, was a reasonable one and I probably had it. Uh, I didn't predict perhaps, I don't know, famously, I don't think I ever said it on record that the ZK rollups would be so quick. I remember thinking like, what would it take to build one? And I was like, it's going to take years of effort. And, you know, now that I'm working at Circuit, it's, I'm doing it. So like, you know, it's a change, it's definitely, definitely changed. Um, but I, I definitely thought it would take a lot longer. It's still going to take some time to get them right, to, to have everyone's sort of niche um, applications or, or innovations put in. But um, it makes sense to me that there are a number of, of, of roll-ups out there. I think I did say that somewhere on, on a podcast. 
uh, that there's going to be more than one, you know, that, that will be out there because if we actually want to get regular internet scale activity on a blockchain, we need more block space and one roll up will help with that, but 20 will really help with that. And there's probably a limit to how many people can sort of swallow up. I don't think you want a thousand roll ups, um, but a small number of tens seems pretty plausible because you could have a chain that's you know very good at, at gaming or something, or you could have very niche new opcodes introduced in some places that make um, some apps work really well, but scare some developers because you know it allows different languages and, and they're not familiar or you know they, they don't like that for whatever reason. So um, I think the prediction that there'd be many of them is one that was totally fair. Uh, the surprises were definitely how quick some of the technical innovations came. Um, even the, the, the ZK stuff, you know, we, we've ramped up on quite a bit over the last couple of years. It sort of went from, oh yeah, this could happen. Like when Platinum Plasma was still talking, I was like, yeah, well, if we ever get zero, a zero knowledge, I think StarkNet was around. They were one of the, the longest running players in the field. And I think, it was like, oh, if they can get it to work, it'd be so cool. But not only did they seem to do that, so did like a bunch of other people. And that was a bit surprising because I, I didn't think people would sit down and do the work for the first little while. Uh, but I'm sure glad they did because now it's simplified, you know, airports simplified uh, a bunch of other development. Um, what I think the next predictions will be, which isn't really your question, uh, but I'll, I'll take a chance to do Yeah, I, I, I was going to ask, like, what, what are the challenges and like what, you know, what's the next steps here? Yeah, I think the next steps will be really trying to differentiate um, features and functionality and rollups going forward. Uh, because what I think people are starting to see is um, EVM compatibility is definitely a really good first step. And I would suggest most rollups follow that path um, because you can get smart contracts very quickly at all of this. But then when you don't have to rely on everyone in the world to agree with your virtual machine, you just get your core user base, which is you know hopefully substantial and, and, and well-defined, you can do really cool things that you can add other functionality that other people either don't want or don't care about. Um, and that could be a new opcode so that you can do something, you know, like a different cryptographic primitive could be done on chain built in. And then you support a whole bunch of new, you know, signing algorithms or whatever you want. Or, or it can be, you know, ways to share data. So you have different interoperability or you can do a whole bunch of other things. So I think the next prediction will, is we'll start to see everyone really master the EVM compatibility very quickly over the next year, maybe year and a half, maybe two years. And then we'll see cool, unique innovation that really leaves just being compatible behind, right? Something else that, that will help differentiate each roll up, um, but also add core functionality. So like not differentiating just for a marketing point of view, but literally to do something different and unheard of, right? Like, and that could be, I don't know, you know baking in Bitcoin or something. I, I, I don't know. I'm, and I'm actually hearing things about Bitcoin layer twos these days. So maybe that's, you know, a very easy prediction to make, but. Oh yeah, they're coming. And they're yeah. coming in hot right now. Rob, have you been seeing much? Ian from Espresso has been telling me so much, like, yo, man, you got to pay attention. You guys got to do a series about Bitcoin L2s. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I was on a call. Yeah. Earlier. <laughs> um, I don't know much about them, to be honest. I have to, I have to research. Can you tell me a little bit more about, like, are you excited about that? Is it, do you see? I, I'm excited because, and I don't want to get too deep into it and kind of uh, uh, stray away from Ethereum, the promised land, but what's exciting to me is that the Bitcoin's got this proof of work security problem wherein if there's not enough transaction fees generated, if Bitcoin's price isn't high enough in the future, mm -hmm. then Bitcoin's kind of screwed. But no, with this, we bring act activity on chain, fees are generated, Bitcoin security is much more uh, sustainable uh, as a model without necessarily needing the price to go berserk. That to me is like, like, Sure, I will let the DGENs DGEN on all the chains and all the NFTs and Ponzi it up. But if we can just contribute to Bitcoin security for long term health of the broader ecosystem, that kind of is like really prominent for me. Currently, I think it's very early stages, but you know, we're working with a project, Cordow. They're very cool. Um, there's a couple of Bitcoin L2s like uh, Botonics, uh, Ortify, um, and of course, it's different NFTs. So, mm -hmm. yes, very interesting things here. Cool. Yeah. I mean, What's good for Bitcoin is probably still good for the ecosystem, right? Like, 
for better or worse, a lot of people still only think of Bitcoin as Web3. And, and I think we should, we're trying to change that, but uh, this will help, I hope. So, uh, yeah, I, I'll have to look into it too and take a look at uh, when When Zerkit compatibility, well, first, <laughs> I'm, 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 when Bitcoin L2 is in Zerkit, so what is Zerkit? <laughs> So yeah, so, so let me let's let's open this can of worms here. Sounds good. Yeah, so Zerkit's a new L2 that uh, I'm helping to build, and uh, I'm a technical lead there. And it's a it's a EVM equivalent zero knowledge rollup with a focus on security. So to start, just as I said, you know we're going to be EVM equivalent and and sort of meet that that bar. Uh, but then we we want to do more for the ecosystem. And one way we're doing that, other than a whole bunch of cool research that. Honestly, probably isn't super sexy to like 90% of people. Like we have unique MSM optimizations in, in our GPU stuff, which is cool, but like most people won't notice the difference there, right? It'll shave the prover time a little bit, but uh, you know, it's not gonna be mind blowing. What instead we wanna do is focus on another area of the ecosystem that we really care about, which is um, security. So everything we do at, at, research, at, um, at Zerkit in terms of research is to try to help produce a more secure system. Because as I said, you know, hacks have happened on bridges and other systems, of course, uh, in this space. But every time that happens, you know, the media picks it up and everyone goes crazy. Like, oh, Web3 is over. It's another hack. We can't survive this one, possibly. Um, we have, and I think we will continue to, to survive a bunch of them. But if we can do something to prevent them from happening in the, in the first place, you know, I think it's sort of our duty to at least try. So one way that we could do this for example, is you know add, add some cool functionality into Zerkit where we check some properties of, of transactions and if they're not particularly helpful or they violate some invariance, um, we can slow them down and maybe notify people. So if you know if you de deploy a DeFi app and there's a transaction in the mempool that's going to wipe out your funds and it's not coming from you, <laughs> you know maybe you you think that's a hack and, and so there should be a delay. Um, maybe that's not the, the exact approach we're going to take with the system, but the idea of, of drawing in these type of circuit breakers in DeFi into um, the sequencer of, of a rollup, for example, sounds really interesting, and it's something we want to explore. And first and foremost, um, Zerkit is a research-based project. Like, it will go live. There will be a main net. Uh, it will be a functioning network. Well, we want to try to do stuff that is different. We Our end goal is not just EBM compatibility. We want to see what we can really get out there. So it's it's a bunch of things, but the short answer is is it's going to be security. So Robin, about this video, um, oh, good, Rob. I talked about the uh, basic contestable roll-up structure and with regards to ZK, but you go ahead, shoot shot, buddy. <laughs> we did. We did just have. Uh, a, I already uh, lost my thought. <laughs> we we did just have a conversation with the uh, the CEO of Tyco, um, oh, yeah. working on the zk roll up, and uh, he was he was educating us on um, based contestable roll ups. The based part, not super relevant to this conversation, but the contestable part um, does have some. Uh, some relevance here because as you say, like the circuit breaker idea where if there is something that seems like it's malicious or uh, maybe an attack on the network, then anyone can dispute or contest this transaction. Very similar in this case, it sounds like you're, you're, you know, suggesting that uh, there's like a, there's like a pause feature, like a circuit breaker feature while that contest dispute resolution process is happening. Is that yeah, well, I, that sounds pretty familiar. I'm actually not familiar with the, the contested notion. I, I've, I've seen other stuff from Tyco, the boosted rollups, for example, I think is a really cool idea. Uh, this is, I think, one of those things where I said, you know, people are deviating from just EVM compatibility, right? They're adding opcodes to have possible really cool layer threes or layer twos or, or wherever they're putting that output. Um, but this contestable idea, you know, could be very much related. I'll have to take a look to, mm -hmm. to be sure that I, I know exactly what's going on there. But yeah, it'll be similar, I guess, uh, in the sense that, you know, it will slow things down if, if it's particularly problematic. And mm -hmm. if we can prevent just one hack that way, I think that's a really good draw, right? Yeah. And obviously, we have to be careful about how that's defined and, and what it means to contest or, you know, quarantine a transaction, which is the terminology we're going to use. Mm -hmm. um, 
because you don't want to censor people and you don't want the, the good transactions to go through. And, and probably there will be people who argue code is law and there are no bad transactions. But if your transaction, you know, wipes out millions of dollars from the average user, uh, right. I'm not sure code is law is the right defense for that. So uh, I'm willing, you know, to at least explore the opportunity and see, see what we can do. And maybe, maybe it's very, very effective and maybe we can use it in other ways, right? Once we have the system to detect invariance and, and do things with the mempool, we can do other things too. So, um, And that yeah. kind of seems like a general sentiment of ZK rollups, at least the responsible ones going live. It's like the validity proofs need time to mature in terms mm -hmm. of being able to be let loose into the wild. And so there's got to be some sort of mechanism, incentive design in the most decentralized and and uh, well-designed manner to allow for these kind of uh, uh, quarantine periods, fallbacks, contestations. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a matter of building responsible tech and letting the technology uh, kind of mature. Now, on the flip side of this, do we really need ZK proof for every single transaction on Zircuit on insert ZK roll up here? Like, is there a world where there's a kind of a hybrid mechanism that, that Zircuit adopts or how do you guys go, go about applications which are perhaps not as financialized or not as much value at stake for smaller, quicker transactions? You know, do you need a ZK proof for all of those? How are you thinking about the roll-up landscape when, when it comes to the necessity of having a ZK proof for every single transaction um, and kind of how you're looking at that? Okay, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, I... I don't have a, a solid, you know, yes or no answer. It, it wasn't a yes or no question, but like, I, I don't know where I, I really land on, on which side of the fence. My gut says, you know, ZK should be everywhere um, because we want to always be able to trust the um, computation, whatever that computation is. That's sort of the whole point. But some people like Vitalik have always said, there are some things you're willing to lose, right? Like uh, I think he, he had a blog post recently where you know you could say, uh, if if you're just losing sort of your social network status or a like, you know, right? if it goes down, you can't recover that data, or someone really was fraudulent about it, it's it's maybe not the end of the world. Um, but if you lost millions of dollars in a transaction, which you know I'm not doing, but if other people did that, right, uh, that would be really really bad. Um, right. I. You know, I think that is a good notion of like where where do we need full security versus sort of partial security and, and how much we invest into the tech that secures these systems. But I I think the gut says let's do everything on ZK, at least for now, is reasonable because these systems are actually, you know, becoming very feasible and very easy. The the sort of black magic, the hardness is being, you know made understandable and and implemented in ways that it's almost more effort to change um, some computational models on a system. So some sort of hybrid where maybe you only ZK proof some things um, is, is a worthwhile exploration. And I think um, one that people should undertake. I don't think we've really thought too much about it from a practical point of view at Circuit, but uh, it would be very interesting. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if, if everything works in ZK, let's just do everything ZK. ZK also has some nice benefits that you can do, you know, like coprocessors sort of natively embedded if you wanted, right? So you could you could have off-chain apps running ZK systems that are different ZK proofs and then just verifying them on chain. And you could possibly tie that closely together if they're using the sort of the same ZK system. Um, and I think that's really cool because then you stop even executing on chain, you start just verifying on chain and it, sort of skips ahead on the, on the roadmap for Ethereum. Um, to be clear, you know, that tech would have to be developed in a meaningful way and, and the specific applications obviously need to be built. But when ZK is so attainable for, for now on chain, like let's put everything in a ZK chain because we can. not And, you know, that probably means there is, you know, going to be a long-term victory for things like zero knowledge rollups over optimistic ones, even though optimistic rollups right now have a lot, lot of the user um, space. 
Uh, I could be very much wrong about that. And, you know, there's a world where, where the optimistic rollups actually play that lesser secure hybrid model that you were just talking about, right? You could imagine a world where a blockchain that tracks your gaming state for, I don't know, World of Warcraft or something is on an optimistic rollup because maybe you're not so concerned if you really lose your player status, right? And it's very cheap. Maybe it's even cheaper. I think Zircon uh, and all the ZK rollups will actually close the gap on the price quite a bit so that it's, it's not quite noticeable, as I mentioned, or there'll be extra value to make up for the difference if there is a difference. Uh, but this world where, where optimistic rollups can play that type of part would be very, very interesting. And it actually be very easy because most of them are, are, are pretty close to mature, if not mature, right? Maybe they're just missing a couple fraud proof testings or, or extra clients for diversity, but they're actually, you know, they're, they're probably more mature than most of the, the ZK proof systems. And, and you're right. We do need the maturity to happen for these, these ZK systems. So, um, for now it definitely makes sense. And they have a good place. So Zerk is all in ZK. Zerk is no going to be all in ZK. No optimistic, none of that. No, ZK. no, I, I don't think we have any plans. Full on. Full on, yeah. I, on the test net, you know, there's some some blocks that aren't proved right now just because like we don't want to spend tens of millions of dollars running a prover on test net blocks. But in, in mainnet, zero knowledge all the way. It's going yeah. to be, you know, every, every sense. block has a ZK transition. That's we'll You guys are optimizing for security. Um, that, yeah. Got it. Okay. And this is something that like, I've heard about like ZK and it's like still somewhat of a mystery to me. Maybe it is to other people too. That's this concept of a circuit, which like exists outside of ZK proofs. But like when we're talking, and I bring this up mostly because the name here is circuit. There's obviously yeah. circuits involved and I I've heard them related to ZK tech. So like, could you kind of like demystify this concept of a circuit and how it relates to zero knowledge proofs? Oh, I can try. I definitely, you know, I uh, tried to give some talks on this in the past and I feel like I never nailed the concise argument, but I can, I can definitely give you a high level view that people can pick apart and say, actually, that's wrong, but I can, I can try. So it's basically the notion that you're, you're taking an arbitrary computation, which in this case, updating a blockchain state and you're, you're making it into a, a virtual circuit which you then sort of virtually execute, right? In the same way that you can take a computation and put it on a hardware circuit, a real circuit, like the laptop you're running right now, um, and it'll do something all the time. Uh, you can you can make those circuits virtual and say, you know, it's it's not a, a new stream of electricity per se going through it, but a signal and, and the signal's virtual, it's just some bits. And as you do that, you know, you add some extra stuff to make sure that the only way you could have computed the circuit, simulated it, run it effectively, um, is if you had the right inputs. And so you, you get this computation, which is the same as the computation you wanted, but in a system where the circuits only were simulated correctly, if you knew what you were doing, you didn't lie. And the circuits were built correctly, of course. I'm going so, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to refine what you said up until this point, just to make sure I like, clarify my own understanding, which is that it's, it sounds like a circuit is like a series of state machines that communicate with one another and execute state changes. Is that, and, and the, like the most simple explanation of that being like, like this, like a configuration of state machines and like, yeah, and, sure. and I'll, I'll simplify it even further and just say a state machine is a ledger, right? A, like a, a, a state is a ledger. It's a certain, certain balance in all these accounts at any given time. So mm -hmm. a, a circuit is basically a configuration of ledgers. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's reasonably fair. I think there's some technical stuff. The the academic in me is sort of saying we should go back to the precise definitions, but I, you know, it's not a lecture, so I'll, I'll avoid that. But yeah, the, the state machine analogy is probably pretty reasonable. Just think of the the circuit as like it's even less than than that in some way. It's 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 a gate if you know what a gate is, right? Like it's if two signals are on and it's an AND gate, then the output's also on. But if either one of them is off or both are off, it's it's off. So it's a very, it's a collection of these very, very small state machines, if you will, um, that eventually go up to something big. And and that's also why you hear like these big numbers where you say, oh, I have many, many gates in my circuit. And that's why my prover is so slow, for, for example. Uh, it's because 
if your gate is so small and you want to do such a complex computation, you need a lot of gates, right? In the same way that your current CPU on your, your, your laptop, you know, evolved from just that AND gate I was talking about, you know, in the 40s to a whole bunch of, of, of gates connected to make you have, you know, the ability to, to, to do whatever you're doing. So, uh, yeah, I think that's fair. Um, and of okay. course, you know, most of the time you can abstract that away and, and, and you can sort of use a high level language to actually write the circuit and you don't have to worry about the AND gate specifically. It's generated automatically, thanks to a lot of pioneering research by a lot of people. Um, but yeah, that's, that's fair. Very cool. Okay. So, um, like ones and zeros here would be the signals, right? Like yeah. if I, one is a signal, zero is a signal. If it's an and gate and it's one and one, then, then the output is one. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm catching, I'm catching your drift. You, you, um, you. Yeah. Okay. So then like, uh, bring this a little bit more to like current times. Uh, there was a prover network that went live a couple days ago called succinct. Awesome. Um, yeah. So like, like that just kind of like inspired some ideas in my mind. It's like, if I was to compete in this prover network, frankly, I have no clue how to run a prover, but I'm starting to learn. So if I was to try to build the quickest prover and kind of like win these proving competitions and, and earn money from doing so, I would essentially try to build a prover with the least amount of gates because that would be the quickest proof. Is that I, I think, um, I don't know if that's entirely accurate. So generally, you're probably wanting to prove the same thing, right? You're trying to prove a specific circuit was executed correctly. Um, so I don't know that you have too much flexibility in the gates you can change on the circuit because, you know, you're trying to prove the same thing, uh, which is a state transition, for example. But you could change how that is simulated. And that's sort of the key, I think, bit here. So when you simulate it, you know, you have to compute a whole bunch of outputs of, of these, you know, gates per se. Uh, or something else like polynomials and things like this. Mm -hmm. And through that, you have different operations that you could possibly do faster and better, right? So if you had, for example, um, different ways to compute uh, multiscalar exponentiation in, in over some finite field in, in whatever that means, it's a mathematical mm -hmm. operation, which is like an add, but on crack somewhere, right? <laughs> like it's, it's very much more than just an add. Uh, if you could do that faster, then you're still accomplishing exactly what the circuit does. So you're not changing... Um, what the gates are doing, but you're changing how the gates are being simulated, then you're starting to win on, on, on that. And, and maybe there are other optimizations, like seeing some circuits are not always used, so you can discard them or things like this. But I would bet, you know, most of it will be these other types of optimizations where you can either parallelize it or mm -hmm. optimize operations or throw better hardware at it. Those are the, probably the three most naive approaches. And maybe you can do much more. Maybe you can do very different things. Um, that's where I would start. So, you know, maybe, but I would say, you know, optimizing. This is also why you see program uh, people saying, oh, we have really cool um, MSM tech or FFT tech or various operations of refinite builds that become faster because you're like, oh, that actually translates into better prover time. Mm -hmm. And better prover time, you know, translates to better costs because right. you're not running so, so much. And so, so Zerkit is like, can, you know, we, we started out this conversation by saying like, you know, all these rollups are starting to pop up. Mm -hmm. Like some of them are good. Some differentiation and, and variation is very mm -hmm. healthy. At a certain point, do we need like an infinite amount of rollups? Probably not. So there's some happy medium there where there's enough variation to, to provide something new and useful and different. Um, what is Z Zirkit doing? Like, what's special about the configuration of, of Zirkit's circuits? Like, what's special there that makes you guys new and different and useful? Yeah, I Did mean... somebody say Zirkit circuits? Is it a circus? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a great... Uh... It's a great phrase. I've definitely used that before. It's a, I think I said, circuit, circuit, circus sometimes when I'm looking at, at the code. Um, there's there's some stuff that is definitely different. Um, you know, we started by looking at what was out there, of course, because people had started to, to do some of this and open source it. But we quickly realized we wanted to change sort of like how the proof pipeline works. Um, so you can change which parts are, are, are proved where. You can change how the proofs are then aggregated. You can change, you know, the layers of proofs so that you sort of compression is not 
perhaps the, the correct word, but you can sort of aggregate a bunch of proofs. So you sort of prove several transactions, for example, in parallel, and then take the, the aggregation of that of those proofs. So now you have a single proof that represents all of those proofs. And you can just keep doing that recursively to a certain point that is useful. Um, and you know, then you just get ultimately one proof at the end of the day. Uh, so what we did partly was change how that aggregation works. So we have our custom layers of, of aggregation for some nice reasons. I can't share too many of the details in part because I'm not working at that level of the code and in part because we haven't open sourced the code just yet. Uh, so I don't wanna give anything away. But we've also focused on that other thing, which is sort of improving these optimizations for specific op uh, operations. So uh, we have custom MSM implementations and ideas for implementations, which are being implemented that will change how the MSM is computed. Uh, not what it does, right? Fundamentally, it'll be you know the same inputs and outputs as anyone else might be doing, but we'll have a, a certain set of unique optimizations, which is pretty cool. In the past, these optimizations, you know, are things you could patent. Uh, I don't think we're going to. I don't know if we're going to patent them. I, it depends how effective they are, and I'm probably going to open source them, so I don't know what it'll mean to have a patent. Um, but we we are looking at at that type of optimization where you can get some pretty substantial wins on the lowest level primitives that make sense to sort of optimize and deal with. And this is part of the reason we started, you know, actually saying, oh, we should have our own. It's because we had an idea and we didn't want to just, you know, go give it to someone else. We wanted to see if we could do it on our, on our own. And um, so, yeah, the, 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 the circuit pipeline is definitely different. The fundamentals of some of the primitives are also a little bit different, but otherwise the circuit, you know, faithfully implements or we're being testing at least uh, all the opcodes on the EVM. Maybe not. Could you, could you unpack those acronyms just in case someone wants to like take a deeper look? Like in this in this context, what does MSM mean? And, sure. and yeah. the other one, FFT, I think. Yeah, uh, MSM is multi-scalar exponentiation. So it's a it's a primitive where you, I guess, multi-scalar exponentiate. So it's, it's a finite field operation. Uh, I don't know that I can define it off the top of my head particularly well. Um, the other one is uh, FFT, which is a fast Fourier transform. So this is uh, an operation that deals with polynomials and um, does something there, which we could also talk for hours about. Is it, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't, <laughs> yeah, it I don't, might take two years of calculus to really understand what, what's going we're on. Gonna leave, we're going to leave any and all Fourier analysis out of this conversation. Yeah. I mean, Rob um, loves math, but I think this might even be over his head. I mean, I, took, I mean, 4A analysis is a doozy. Uh, that's for sure. So I think, I think. It's a uh, doozy. Yeah. So we'll, we'll leave it at this. We're going to, we're, we're going to drop Rob on this DK circuit coding train 30 day boot camp build circuits best app. Get ready. Yeah. Coming Get ready. Soon. What's the, uh, what does that process look like? Um, Jan, what's the two things on Zirkus ecosystem? What is the developer tooling infra um, and how is the ecosystem looking? Like, how are you guys planning to build that out? And then also, how are you guys going to be able to talk to other rollups and interoperate? Yeah, so uh, I can answer almost all of those. Um, I think the only thing we haven't really considered is is explicit external interoperability with other rollups. It's not that we don't want to do it. We just haven't gotten there yet on the sort of building out the core infrastructure. Um, but to answer the questions about developer experience, it's pretty straightforward. You change an endpoint on your, you know, I would say hard hat, but I guess Foundry is the thing right now that everyone uses or MetaMask or whatever your favorite wallet is. And it, it, it just works. Um, there might be an, an, a, the occasional exception if they're not integrated correctly, but um, more or less you change the endpoint and it's just like you're talking to Ethereum and everything can be deployed exactly as it can on the chain. So very minimal overhead, um, there, uh, the testnet is, is currently down because of the update to Propsipolia, but it'll be up in a, in a day or two, I would expect. Um, but you can try it out for yourself. Everything there will work just like it does on Ethereum. And if it doesn't, please let us know because that's what testnets are for. Um, but everything has gone smooth so far for us. Um, so the development experience, pretty straightforward, pretty easy. We're building out the rest of the tooling that that's sort of necessary to complement the sort of actual development. So we have a block explorer, obviously. We have you know all the stuff you sort of want. 
Um, we do have a native bridge to get stuff on and off the chain. And whatever we don't have, we're building it. And this brings me to the next part of, of partnerships and, and uh, these types of integrations. Um, and we're talking to a bunch of people. So we're, we're talking to a whole bunch of projects so that when we go live uh, on a main net where it really makes sense, um, we're going to have a bunch of apps on there, you know, with all the, the stuff that you sort of want on a chain. And um, admittedly, that's not really my departments. I don't know who they are, but, you know, they're, they're the big names. I've heard of them. I just, I don't know where, where every project is on, on the, the sort of scale of, of ready to go or, you know, still preparing for it. Um, so the, the short answer is, you know, we're, we're talking to people for sure. We have lots of interest. And if you, we haven't talked to you and you are interested, please reach out. It's not necessarily my department, but I can point you to the person who can help you out with that. So, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be a seamless Ethereum-like experience that uh, will capture everything. And and what we, you know, what we're really interested in is some of those partners who want to take advantage of the security-focused features, right? So if you, if you in the past, you know, we're, we're reluctant about some some smart contract security, and you think that detecting an invariant at a transaction before the transaction hits is something that's very interesting to you. Like, come talk to us so that as we're building out that functionality, we can, you know, have that in mind. But if you're not interested in that either, it'll just work like Ethereum, and it'll be smooth, and it won't take you very long to, to change your endpoint, you know, 30 seconds, you know. According to Rob, it's doozy, so I'm sure you're going to have tons of uh, patience here since we can well, just code ZK apps now. Because you know, the rollup is EVM compatible, you're not building anything directly ZK, right? Uh, when we open source the code, if you want to look at our code and suggest improvements, cool. That's a whole other can of worms. That's That will be complicated, uh, scary, <laughs> and you know, welcome. We'd love to have that feedback. But if you're just building a DAP developer, the ZK almost doesn't matter, right? It's just... A chain with fast finality. Um, we have we have no privacy, so you don't have to worry about like shielding transactions and hiding it. Um, that's currently not on on the roadmap. Right gotcha. now, we're getting just faster finality than than other rollups and cheaper than Ethereum. That's the goal. So, are you guys going to post the the data to Ethereum? Like, yeah, yeah. For now, that's the plan. Um, we're certainly thinking of other DA solutions, um, but with four eight four four. Four, the 4844, the IP4844, uh, actually really close, closer than than sort of we thought when we started this project. Uh, we're going to at least try that, see if that works as well as we want it to be the first time. Uh, I'm yeah. not sure that, you know, monolithic is the end game or the desired thing of everything, but certainly it's going to be somewhat simple to develop. On the test net, you know, obviously we're doing that without um, 4844 um, blobs right now, but we'll... Right. We'll explore that option. We'll build it out, and then we'll see. And you know, maybe there will be other approaches we can take. Either you know, you can switch where your your data goes, or maybe we'll look at other DA solutions that end up being cheaper or trustworthy. But we definitely want to make sure that security is a focus. And so, to start, the fewest trust assumptions comes with everything on Ethereum. And right. when we start to relax those, we want to do those, do that for for the right reason and with the right consideration. We're, we're going to move faster than Ethereum, but we're not just going to overnight be like, yeah, let's switch to a different DA. Because and that, yeah, make, that makes Zerkit a true roll-up, right? Not a Volition or a Validium or, a, or an yeah, Optimium. Correct. Yeah, it'll be a strict ZK roll-up. Um, you know, I think the idea of a Volition is very attractive. Uh, I, I don't want to promise it because I don't know what the engineering overhead will look like. And, and I want to get to mainnet before we, we I promise other things. Um, but yes, it'll be a full ZK roll up. So no, from no. the builder's perspective, like a founder's perspective, technical, you, you have your sip of water if you need there, sir. That's um, <laughs> the key consideration for, for you from switching from away from Ethereum's data uh, storage, data publishing, data availability, however you want to kind of call it, um, is strictly with regards to security and kind of like decentralization. That's kind of like the key thought is like, okay, Maybe we won't do it on Celestia or Avail or Eigen or you know insert your DA here because of these reasons or yeah like I mean what, we want to make sure through your mind we want to make sure we understand those reasons and and what we are trading off from that um, you know yeah. I I don't think any of those projects are bad let me be very clear I think they all have their place and I honestly think we'll we'll 
consider each and every one of them at some point, right? To, to some extent. And um, we may very well go, go down that road, but for now, the simplest, most straightforward approach is, is, is everything on Ethereum. And until we understand exactly what the trade-offs are or how they fit into the roadmap or, you know, what our priorities are, right? Like, for example, it would be really nice to also have a decentralized sequencer. We don't have one right now. Um, like most rollups, we don't have one right now. Uh, but which is more important, a decentralized sequencer or a decentralized data availability layer? I don't know that most people have a strong answer to that. And it's actually not something I've given too much thought to just yet either, because we don't we don't have a mainnet. Once I have a mainnet, I can start talking about what I really want, you know, the dream roll-up to look like. Um, I haven't and I my dream roll roll up might consist of both of those options. Um, but there are more practical aspects, and that's what we're focusing on at the moment. So it's not to say we won't ever be with a different DA provider or solution. Um, you know, this. Anything could happen. Um, maybe this is too much of a cop out, but uh, yeah, we could even, we could switch layer ones if we really really thought that was a really good use case. I don't think yeah. we're going to do that, but you know, it's it's a research based project. We'll go where we think the the best results for the end users using the chain. You know, we'll we'll go and want results from because that's yeah do. When may that serve? Hopefully this year. That's definitely the plan. Um, I don't want to commit to any tighter deadline than that because when you commit to a deadline, people start getting upset when you miss the deadline. So um, Testnet's been up for a couple of months now. Um, other than the small change to Sepolia that happened um, recently, it's it's gone pretty smooth. There's been no issues. So um, we're chugging along. We just got to finish cleaning up some of the internals and we open source it and get some security, you know, reviews or take a look at it from other people. And um, and then hopefully we can get it out this year as, you know, as soon as possible without risking security considerations. But we don't want us to release a product that um, anyone is scared to use or that we are scared to have users on because we haven't tested something or we haven't considered something. And this is also partly why, you know, to go back to the DA, like maybe yes, but we also want to say yeah. and, and if we haven't had the time to do that, I'm not committing to to use it. Is there like a like like also on this on this uh, security train, is there like an idea to kind of like like roll out mainnet in stages, almost like eigenlayers doing with their caps, like only allow a certain amount of TVL at any given time? Uh, yeah, that's actually something we've been talking about. Um, we don't know exactly what those stages would look like, but uh, you know, certainly what we're not going to be doing is launching the network where we're sort of a stage three or two from Vitalik's you know stages roll up, uh, where we have a fully functioning thing where we just hands off and like ah oh, we're good we're done. Um, it's it's going to be some some level of stages where we can possibly intervene in in case something goes wrong because. You know what would keep me up at night is is someone putting on a bunch of money, something going down, and we can't recover those funds for, for the person. Um, ideally, that never happens. I, I want to stress, you know, that it's not the goal at all. But uh, there definitely will be stages so that we can prevent that. Just like most of the other rollups, there'll be some level of centralization to begin with, and you know, as long as all the tech works out, we'll become more decentralized as um, as we can. Um, but even the centralization, you know, it's going to be some level of, of baby steps because, as mentioned already on the call, the ZK tech needs, you know, time to mature. And while, you know, we think we're, we're pretty confident about what's going on, it doesn't make sense to just say, here it is. Good luck. Yeah. All right. That's, that's, that's reckless. So, um, yeah, we'll probably do stages. I don't know exactly how long each stage will be or when the stages will be. Um, completed or, or whatever. The reality is the rollup will be you know, under development for a significant period of time still. There's, there's stuff to be done. So we have to keep doing it. But maybe we can get to a point very soon where we're very confident that actually you can use this for all of these features, but maybe not this extra feature or something like this. Go take a look, go test it. 
and test it even better than just a test net, just like actually use it. And, and if something really does go wrong, which we don't think it'll happen, we'll be there to help and support. Got it. Okay, I think we've come far enough and I think it's time to to un unlock this 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 uh, on chain elephant in the room, which is that if you look at certain block explorers for certain rollups that won't be named, you'll notice that if you if you look at the ETH contract address on on such rollups, you have way too much ETH. You have something on 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 the order of like trillions of ETH. Like, don't go check in the, the ETH market cap. It's not trillions of dollars. Like, some of the rollups have trillions of ETH just sitting in a contract, like, like just garnered by a multi-sig or, like, some upgradable contract. So, again, without, like, calling – maybe – all right, if you're curious as to, like, which networks are doing this, please just DM us or DM, DM Jan, Jan, and we'll kind of, like, dig – through it a little bit deeper because uh, we're not trying to publicly shame anyone right now, but maybe later. So tell us like why certain rollups have more ETH on their rollup than the maximum supply of ETH on mainnet and yeah. why they think that's, that's a good thing or, or sure. why are they and, doing it at all? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I not having worked at, at, you know, these rollups, I can't comment always, 100 percent but uh i'll try to try to you know hypothesize as to why and I, I also don't want to shame any of these roll-ups which i'm not going to name um because I, I think it's just a design decision right part of it is uh this particular roll-up did it to simplify um how deposits happen on the l2 right instead of creating it out of sort of thin air all the time they did it once at the beginning of the their system and every time you deposit just sort of takes from that fund and that, that is a very interesting idea. And it, it stems partly because of how the, these circuits work, I think, uh, where, you know, the circuit always says, oh, well, the money must have come from somewhere. So where did it come from? And the only, you know, the easiest way, maybe not the only way, but the easiest way to sort of, to handle that and say, well, pre-fund the Genesis block somewhere so that the circuit always says, oh yeah, it just comes from there, it's fine. Um, but it's exactly these types of decisions that, helped generate uh, like Zirkit as a project. Because so we saw things like that, like, is that the only solution? Can we do something different? Uh, and I'm not sure if we'll, we'll take exactly the same approach. Uh, our current internal plan is to do something different. Uh, it might be a little similar, but it, it you know doesn't sound like, you know, I don't want to put 2 trillion ETH on, a, on anywhere. Or, I mean, I would love to, but if I only, if I earned it correctly and I, I certainly didn't and I won't. Um, but this is this is part of why Zirkit sort of existed was to see, you know, can we do something differently? Because when I look at that that block explorer and I see that, my first instinct, even as an experienced feature, is like, why, why is this the way it is? And I, I actually have no doubt that there there was a design decision made that said, yeah, this is the easiest way, you know, let's do it. But maybe the easiest way is not the most convenient, the most confident, inspiring. Because um, certainly, if that is behind, you know, a critical contract, it's it's kind of scary that that something could change there. Um, so these design decisions changing and and those those rollups making that specific one is part of the fun and research of this area. Um, and you know, I'll say it's it's. It's interesting that it was done this way. Um, like I said, maybe Circuit will have to go that route for mainnet. I, I don't think that's the current plan. Um, but we're going to try to figure out some other way if we absolutely can. And it's these types of research questions that will always make rollups, even rollups which are all claiming to be EVM compatible or in, in sort of air quotes the same, which they're not. Uh, a little bit different, right? There's there's subtle differences across all of these things, and and unfortunately, those differences might incur different risks. I don't think that that particular issue is too risky. Um, certainly, if there's an upgradable contract and the keys are not kept in some way that's meaningful, that maybe is a risk. But I don't think it's particularly like shameful in the end of the day 
if it works and it's secure enough, whatever enough is. Um, yeah. So the the issue is that it works until it doesn't, right? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. You have, and a of, you have a pile of money sitting in there and it's like, yeah, it, like we only go in there when we need some money. It's like, all right, but like what happens if someone gets in there and they just – yeah, so like I really hope these chains who have taken this design decision, you know, do everything correctly in every other area. And and I have no reason to suggest that this isn't the case, but a design that sort of asks this question in the first place to me doesn't sound like the best design. And yeah. and in and maybe it is, but then I, I feel like I should have heard more about it in more places. Like don't sweep it under the rug. Be very open about ah, this is this is a point of risk that we have unfortunately had to introduce and here's why we're doing it, right that would also be very nice to have yeah and which might be out there to be totally fair maybe i've just missed it on some of these roll-ups um but it was without going crazy. like super without opening up like another can of worms here like could you try to make it make sense like why are roll-ups in this position where they have to kind of like pre-fund the genesis block with a certain amount of eth we have bridges right why can't we just take the eth from the main chain yeah so I, I, I think i think i can comment on 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 why this is and and that's it comes down to how the circuits are implemented so at the end of the day to prove you know that you took money from somewhere to to somewhere else legitimately you need a zero knowledge proof that says ah yeah funds existed um wherever in a and you took it to b um and and you can if if you if you're taking from this pre-funded account for example that's very easy for the circuit to see oh yeah there were mon there was money there there's nothing invalid about this transaction as long as the transaction is signed and it only takes the amount that's specified in the transaction etc 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 everything works um but if you tell the circuit hey i'm taking money from nowhere and i'm creating money from, out of thin air like there's nothing fundamentally problematic in a computer science point of view from saying, you know, add something to nothing in a variable. Um, but it, it sort of changes what people want to see in the circuit because now the circuit looks less like Ethereum because you've added this sort of exceptional functionality that means on a deposit, you need to mint stuff out of thin air, which is typically, you know, only reserved whenever Ethereum is normally minted, which is, you know, during consensus on, on the layer one. And, but you've, you've taken that functionality, you've added it somewhere else. So you could, you could change the circuits to say, oh yeah, I'll just do that. But now your circuits look different than say an EVM, or they could look different. Um, and maybe they're more complex, even if they don't look different, because maybe, uh, you know, you can make it look close enough, but you still have to branch in some area. And when you have to do that, the prover time might go up. And so maybe there's a trade-off that says, oh, I really want to have a fast prover, so I can't have this type of branching in this exceptional case. In short, it's a very subtle technical issue that's sort of at the bottom of, of, of sort of the stack um, that is not trivial to overcome. Um, it's not incredibly difficult. They did it. I think the other way of doing it, you know, by disabling, say, circuit signature checks, you could also do. I don't know that you want to do that because if you screw up a signature check fail uh like disabling and you do it too often or someone forges a signature or something someone screws up in another way you might have different risks um but i can also see other worlds right you can see you can do things where you pre-fund it with a couple of these five ten twenty and then you top up that account regularly as part of sequencer fees and maybe that that is sufficient um maybe there, there's another fault that happens if you if you go down that approach which is why i can't say for certain exactly why this has been done um but i'll tell you at circuit we're definitely exploring different options um something like that one i just said where maybe we'll pre-fund just a little bit so that if you really didn't trust us and you did look at our genesis account it might look like 20 ETH, which is a lot but it's not two trillion ETH, right it's mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. the end of the world ETH. it's just right shitty um it's a hard problem yeah okay and, it's these small subtle things that actually like really add up to making these these systems complex and it, and it's therefore why you, some systems have design decisions that are i don't want to say questionable but like 
not well explained or not the way that your intuition would initially say, let's do it this way. Um, it's because there's there's a bunch of these, these small little issues that arise from all the technical stuff of trying to get the EVM in a zero knowledge proof system or into a different type of bullet. Like even optimism changes how um, deposit transactions sort of look inside their geth, right? You can look at their L2 geth and say, they've changed stuff. They have, they have very good documentation on how they've done it. They're optimistic, so that it's slightly different for them. Um, but there's a lot of subtleties that make this type of project not nearly as simple as let's go fork something else and call it our own chain. Like you, you need to do a bunch of different innovations and technical bug fixes and, and revisit some designs to get some, you know, progress as opposed to just trying to get something else to work. Yeah. And with that comes trade-offs. Mm -hmm, exactly. Oh, well, this has been an absolute journey and uh, an absolute pleasure of one. Um, yeah, I mean, if we keep if we keep going any longer, I'm going to start bashing Fourier again. So I <laughs> all I got to say is it's a doozy, and I'm building the next hundred X on Zerkit. Follow me at a Andy. We're going to the moon, baby. We're going to put horse racing on Zerkit. Zero knowledge proof. You'll know for sure that your horse won without knowing how much, when, where. You just got to log in, click a couple buttons, Fourier analysis. Rob's going to code it all up. Go to the moon, so I'll see you guys on there with, with your astronaut suits and, and your horses. All right, thanks for having me. Yeah, and the Zerkats, yeah. Um, thanks, it was yeah, good. thank you, John. <laughs>